Great. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for, for being here. I know uh, mornings after Rave can be a bit of a struggle, so appreciate you all, all being here. Uh, so I'll do a bit of an introduction uh, to myself and the Ethereum Foundation Next Billion program, and then I'll pass it on to the brilliant panelists we have up on stage. So my name, is, my name is Marcus. I am a fellow at the Ethereum Foundation, where I am currently researching the implementations of Last Mile DeFi, focusing primarily in Latin America and essentially asking ourselves how can we leverage DeFi to not just you know, bring financial gain, but actually empower livelihoods in a very real, very tangible way. So always happy to talk about these things uh, at a later stage. And context-wise into the Next Billion team, really the, the essence of Next Billion is to ask ourselves how can we leverage Ethereum and Web3 not just to onboard the Next Billion users, but to create tangible, very visceral changes in their lives and uh, do so at a very scalable level. So, uh, with that, I will pass it on to the three panelists here to my left and allow them to introduce themselves and, and tell us a little bit about what they're working on. Hi, I'm Abhishek Bhattacharya. I'm one of the co-founders at a project called Whirl. <clears throat> what we do is we are a CeFi to DeFi bridge. We, are, we started three years back helping farmers, enabling farmers take loan against their uh, crops that they can store. Right after harvesting, uh, farmers receive very less uh, price for the crops that, for the for per kilogram uh, price for the crops that they grow. We enable them, we encourage them to store it in a warehouse, in a government or a private warehouse, and sell it off after three or four months when the prices are 40% or even sometimes 100 to 200% better. We use blockchain to do that, to bring banks on the table. We'll be discussing about that as well, that how uh, we brought banks onto blockchain. And uh, that is what we've been doing. Now we are going on to decentralized finance soon so that the same farmers in a country like India and maybe everywhere else can get access to DeFi lending as well. Thank you. So I'm Gabriela. I'm from Mexico. Uh, I am working on Bloinx, B-L-O-I-N-X. Um, that's an application, decentralized application, that manages saving circles. Uh, you might know them as tandas, cuchuales, uh, cheat funds, or many ways around the world. Uh, that's a way of people to actually, let's say, get an interest-free loan, if you're one of the first, uh, from your friends or your family members. And if you're the last, you're actually contributing for them to get this, this uh, loan. Why this is important for us in Mexico, in Latin America, Asia, and Africa, it's not easy for us to get a loan. And if we get one, it's super normal to have 50% interest rate, 100%, and people don't read the small letters. So we get into very big debt. So uh, this is why it's important to give them options to actually have these, let's say, social credit uh, options. So that's what we're doing. Hello, everyone. My name is Benson Yoguna. I come from Kenya. Um, we've been working with smallholder farmers with Eka Africa, uh, solving the insurance problem. So agri-insurance has been a problem where we have very low penetration. For years, it has been around 3% of the smallholders uh, taking up insurance. And we feel it's important for them to take up insurance and many other traders who are earning an income because we were able to protect them because lack of insurance has left most of the, the farmers exposed to uh, hunger because after a climate effect, uh, then no food, then it means they can't sell because it also the food has been affected, meaning no income and a whole cycle of unfavorable things. So with that, we are doing this, uh, solving the problems that are making them not take up insurance and blockchain has helped us to do some of these things, which we'll discuss as we go on. Thank you, Marcus. Awesome, thank you. Um, so yeah, an incredible group of people here doing amazing work, uh, really just changing people's lives in, in a very real sense using you know this technology. So I mean, I, I, just before maybe to set a little bit of context, we could just go around and, and uh, just perhaps lay the scene of, you know we've got India, Latin America, and Africa up here on stage. Across each of your respective regions, what have you? What, what is it about the traditional systems and our current incumbent systems that are set in place 
that are currently falling short for whether it's for farmers or for local communities and saving circles, where are traditional incumbent institutions falling short? And on the other side of the equation there, what is it unique, what is unique about DeFi that enables your proposition to be unlocked um, through leveraging you know, distributed ledgers, et cetera? So uh, maybe Abhi, sure. kick it off to you. Sure, currently um, in India, everywhere else also, as we are expanding globally, we've seen many other countries. Um, the, the systems that are in place, for example, talking about the loans that we give to farmers, these are centralized finance loans given by banks since ages, it's not something we brought on. But there's a lot of fraud in that. And that's of course, fraud is the biggest thing that blockchain solves anyway. That's where blockchain finds most use case in fintech. Uh, so as a fintech organization, we saw that the government systems, the, the banking systems, the entire uh, platform that is available to the farmers and to the banks is not, is, is not sufficient. And Blockchain could help. Banks were pulling out of this entire uh, ecosystem, leaving farmers into the hands of usurious money lenders with outrageous interest rates. So that's one, one uh, you know, drawback that uh, systems like in India, the government uh, organizations, they have. And uh, you talked about DeFi. DeFi is a very new thing. Farmers, of course, have nothing to do with DeFi, like to, to understand the concept. But it is at play at the back end where I personally believe that it's access to, so as we say, there are more than 1.7 billion unbanked people across the globe. With DeFi, we do not have to just go wait for a bank to process the loans, even though if it's in real time, it's still 15 minutes, 30 minutes. That's as real time as it gets for the farmers at this moment. But with DeFi, it is access to the global DeFi capital. And on the other hand, it's a good thing for the, for the DeFi lenders as well, because they get access to really stable assets, not, not against speculative crypto. These are crops non-perishable crops, maize, soybean, rice, anything you name it. And that's, that's where they would be interested in driving the DeFi capital, and we would be interested in uh, replacing those systems that are already there, uh, and, and the shortcomings with, with this new system helped by DeFi, blockchain, Web3, altogether. Hey, so uh, situation in Mexico, right? Right now with the Ethereum Foundation, where uh, I'm going to focus on women, what's the situation there? So we have uh, legally a 48-hour work week, so imagine a family, a single mom that has two kids, has to work 48 hours, and then uh, has to take transportation, then she has no time. We don't have a good healthcare system, well, a, a, a child to a daycare system, uh, so it's difficult. So what option do they have? Informality. There are two billion people around the world, talking now about next billion, we have two billion people around the world that are uninformally employed. Why? Because of this, because they uh, sell informally, because they're farmers. So uh, this is the situation. They live day to day. They uh, either bake cakes, sell creams, do massages, or whatever thing they might think of. So uh, it's difficult. What happens when they need, uh, they have medical emergency with their kids? They need cash, right? Uh, they try to get it from a centralized financial institution, but what happens is that they require a proof of income, which they don't have. Uh, so this is a serious issue. They have this option of getting loans from informal lenders, but it's super high interest rates, or they have this other option. What, why? These options already exist. These options have been there for hundred years uh, in many countries, um, what you do there is you put in your social credit, right? So uh, why blockchain? Well, it's decentralized. You can join a saving circle. Uh, yes, you have the same risks of a common saving circle, but we can exploit their uh, traceability. We know exactly what was deposited and when it was deposited and then to who it was, it was paid to. So that's super important in our case where uh, we have a lot of corruption and people doing non, let's say, legal or correct ethical things. So this is important for us. And also we can leverage a reputation uh, system that can eventually uh, serve as a foundation for, for them to actually get a loan from a financial institution for a bigger amount. So this is why blockchain is there, everything is on chain. So uh, it's permanent, immutable, and no subject to change by anyone. So that's why. Wow. I'll, I'll cue what uh, Gabriela uh, said. So in DeFi, in our context in Africa, um, a casing point in Kenya, we have mobile money. 
as is a digital technology. Uh, it's, it, uh, for example, in Kenya, it has over 98% adoption, meaning almost every adult citizen has a wallet, a mobile money wallet. Um, but we still find challenges. Challenges in uh, how, how much they're paying, how much they're paying for the loans. So we have very high interest uh, on the loans. In fact, uh, they are regarded as predatorial. Uh, in, in fact, even the central bank has been tracking down. So this access to finance uh, has been a challenge because of high interest rates. And um, when it comes now to uh, DeFi to protect, for example, income. So a farmer has income. How, what, what, why are, the, are we saying DeFi can help the, uh, solve the problem? So for us, it was the transparency in the traditional insurance business. So uh, an agent will go to the field, convince a farmer to buy insurance, but then keep quiet for a whole six months. The season would take around six months. Next time they see the agent will be next time they're selling. So no information, no, didn't know what policy uh, they took, what was happening about it. Now with blockchain, we're able to enable the farmer using feature phones. Uh, the penetrations of feature phones is high. Uh, to dial a star, a number, and able to see so far you, your policy has triggered this percentage, which is equivalent to this amount of money, and also the triggers that were used to say determine whether they qualify for a claim or not are tamper evident, so we generate hashes, put them on chain so you can, to prove you just need to produce the hash and compare it with the data since we don't publish the pharma data on chain. But yeah, that's how we uh, DeFi and blockchain is revolutionizing financing. Incredible, amazing. Um, yeah, I, I find it really interesting that each of you is sort of working at, through different sectors. You're, you're working very much so, you know, with governments and, and large regulators as well, and trying to figure out a lot of the real-world asset integration as well. And Gabriela, you're very much so kind of working with local, uh, you know, women-level cooperatives and and figuring out like how do you download and work with MetaMask, for example. We were talking about that earlier, right? And how you even would you know add Polygon to your MetaMask wallet and just thinking about what that user experience is like. And then Benson, like you're tying in all this technology that already exists out in the world too, right? And you're saying, hey, we've got M-Pesa, uh, USSD transactions as well, and we're tying in you know, climate data. And so I just appreciate the, the breadth to which each of you is, is, is leveraging this. And on that point, I mean, perhaps, Abi, you could paint a, a little bit of that picture of what it's been like working with uh, kind of incumbent institutions in your jurisdiction, right? So you mentioned you're speaking with banks, you're speaking with you know, regulators in the space as well. You're very much so working with real world assets, which is just a fascinating concept in and of itself too. Um, so I, w I wonder if you could shed a little bit of a light on that because that's been a sure. really sort of hot topic in the space recently, uh, how we integrate real world assets within DeFi. So maybe you can shed some light on that. Yes, I mean, I understand because the entire blockchain ecosystem has always been wondering that uh, how do banks and governments fit in with the ecosystem, how to bring them on board. I have met so many people here, people working with the Colombian government. I work with the Indian government. He's working with the Kenyan government. So uh, definitely now banks and governments and all those institutions have started opening up to, you know, to, to adopting blockchain based systems. But then there are certain boundaries that you always, always would have to keep in mind. So for example, I, we could not have just asked to ask a bank to come and join us on a public blockchain, right? Like Ethereum, Polygon. Um, but on the other hand, uh, so, so it has to be designed very specifically so that you can take them in confidence. One very important thing about banks and, uh, I mean, especially big banks, right? And in India, there are uh, a handful of big banks, big orgs, and uh, is that their sales cycles are too long because it's just how they are, right? And further crossing the barrier of uh, going onto a blockchain platform internally, they have that bureaucracy as well. That is a tough sell already. But one thing we have constantly seen, seen in our use case is that not a single bank has ever said that, uh, no, this is not something we want. Because again, this is not a domain. This is called warehouse receipt finance. You store a crop, you take a loan against it. It's as simple as that. It has been, in fact, it has been, it is one of the oldest lending products known to mankind. What we did was we, we, we just made it better, right? But banks knew it, and banks have been facing these frauds since decades. So, and they tried solving it with legacy technologies, which they haven't been able to. So they were open to, at least open to adopting blockchain, right? They knew firsthand, so yeah, th there's a very clear dis uh, distinction here. Firsthand, they knew we are only talking about blockchain technology, and we are not talking about cryptocurrency. 
blockchain uh, the banks on blockchain will barely ever get involved with uh, cryptocurrency at least in such use cases not in uh, the ones where we are talking about cbdc or or uh, cross border payments etc uh, but here they had to be very clear so what we did was to onboard them we created a, a permission blockchain which quorum which was built by jp morgan so came as a perfect use case that jp morgan is running a 400 bank strong network on the same blockchain so why not we use it use the same thing and then when the banks were on board, we also uh, talked to the governments, uh, of course, as much as possible, reaching out. There are state government, governments in India. And then they saw that, okay, there's an opportunity, no cryptocurrency involved. The Indian government has been very supportive of blockchain. I mean, you know, we have seen, we have heard the uh, Indian Honorable Indian Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi, we have seen him speak about blockchain at the Singapore FinTech Festival last year. He was very, very, you know, praiseworthy for, for blockchain. So uh, the government accepts it, accepts it really, uh, till the time we do not bring cryptocurrency. The challenge here is that bringing DeFi onto the same platform, which is where uh, things become very complicated, which is something we're trying to navigate even at this moment. We are trying to keep them uh, separate. Banks won't be inter uh, interacting with the crypto ecosystem. The crypto DeFi lenders won't be interacting with the CeFi lenders, but the farmer should be benefited. So the farmer on the click of a button on a multilingual app would be having access to whether to take this moment, this crop loan against that particular crop in DeFi or in CeFi. That's what we are trying to abstract. It's a challenge. It's still a challenge. I'm pretty sure that Kenya and Latin America, they would be facing the same problems because it's just how it is. I mean, you know, it's just a decade of blockchain that we've seen. Governments are not ready to accept it just at the first go. That's, that's what we've seen. Yeah, yeah, it's true. For example, in our project, uh, we were dealing with the insurance regulator. So you have to prove that you're not using crypto. So you don't, have, you don't need to mention crypto. So that's, we start with efficiency. So we are bringing a technology that will do exactly what has been happening, but now we can pay claims immediately at the end of the season. You don't have to wait for six months. So after a while, the Kenya government is really good. The regulator has what we call a sandbox. So it gives any crazy idea to, to apply and say, we want to try out this and this and this. So part of this uh, sandbox is where we are now trying to see how can we introduce risk, uh, crypto-based risk pools, where now uh, we can pay out from, from a certain risk pool that has been funded by the community, like uh, the DeFi community uh, Abby is talking about. So the regulator has been, yeah, start with the technology and then crypto later. Yeah, I mean, we've obviously seen a lot of um, regulatory talk and that, you know, necessarily what, what, what we'll sort of get bogged down on throughout much of this talk, conversation, but it is a really important consideration, right? Especially if we want to reach sort of critical mass, if we want to do integrations with wider partners as well, thinking about how we do that. Uh, definitely will, will take a lot of thought and, and, you know, having even sort of these spaces for all of us to say, hey, these are the benefits of DeFi. Here is how, and I think being able to align with traditional financial institutions and governments and regulators and saying, listen, these are the, these are the benefits that comes to you. I think oftentimes there's obviously this very um, oppositional position that, that comes up when we speak about DeFi in emerging markets and around the world, right? So, and we've seen the likes of uh, Uniswap with the DeFi Education Fund as well really push for more education, more advocacy at the regulatory level, which is obviously hugely, hugely important. But switching over, you know, gears a, a little bit, uh, Gabriela, I think one of the really fascinating things, and Abby was touching on this too, was the idea that what you're offering, Abby, for example, isn't necessarily new, right? right. Um, and, and being able to warehouse financing isn't a, a particularly new innovation. That's the right. problem is that the traditional financial institutions haven't quite been serving last mile communities because there isn't enough value for them to engage with as they do these things. So Gabriela also with the Tandas, you know, there's something really interesting there as well, where as you said, you know, these are traditions that are hundreds of years old. So particularly with DeFi, like what, what is it about Tandas and decentralized finance that unlocks that value and, and really enables people to be able to do this at scale? Yes, for, uh, so people, we're people, we like tradition, especially in markets like Latin America. Uh, we do what our parents and grandparents did because it's just how we are. We're a very familiar, uh, let's say, uh, community. So uh, what happens if you, for example, um, someone t tells you, hey, get into crypto because you can pool your funds and then you can put it in a farm and then you get the yield and then you're a farmer and it's like, right? 
uh, tell this to a mom who lives day by day and has very few to actually take that risk, right? So uh, what happens there is that this is a way to get them with a known thing, right? They all know saving circles, they already have been in many of these many times. So you take this something known into the blockchain and then you get them, hey, you can use your wallet, uh, you're using your saving circle, but they don't know they're using ADAP, so eventually they will be able to get loans to stake, to eventually get into a pool and do whole DeFi things, right? And they can, that can unlock like that fear of what's this, right? That yield and it's just too much information from the beginning. So these tools that are things that have already been happening many years, uh, can enable this to go to an audience that may not be that technologically savvy, but has a need for these technologies. And they can use it for something very tangible, just like, like we saw with UBI, right? For pay for uniforms for school or for a medical emergency or for something that could really benefit them in day by day, right? So that's why we think these types of tools known could be good for these next billion users we're looking at. Yeah, um, case in point in Kenya as well, what, what or in Africa, um, to actually have a farmer operate a wallet and they can deposit and withdraw it, yes, as Gabriela puts it, poof, it, it may not, it's quite hard, it's not, it's a, it's, it will take time as to train, but we see an additional layer of, we see a layer of, um, we call it custodians. So for example, we have um, a payment gateway, an on-ramp, off-ramp called Kotani Pay. We have Bitlipa in Kenya doing a good job. So what they do, they they store the keys for, for the farmer and now translate each wallet into a USSD-based wallet. So a farmer would dial star 800 hash, they'll see, oh, access your wallet, oh, yeah, withdraw to M-Pesa because M-Pesa is their mobile money. They can withdraw. But you see, they are, they, they are used to the USSD. They are used to M-Pesa. The part of wallet connection, somebody else is doing it at another level for them. And with time, as we get more adoption of smartphones, because also smartphone is an issue, uh, we have like a third of the people uh, have smartphones or two thirds, and the third is the one that uh, still has the feature phones, the button ones. So once we see more of smartphones coming in, then we feel more people will be able to control the, the DeFi wallets on themselves. And uh, yeah, and also we other strategies that we are introducing. Uh, the government is really keen on capital flight. So on ramp, you changing your local currency to uh, USDC, for example. So if you, 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 we start with projects that bring in money into the country, for example, there's Diva Protocol and Fortune Connect. We tapping donations globally and reaching and pushing through like uh, this off ramp to, to the farmer. So the farmer is able to access uh, USSD and withdraw, for example, a donation. But then uh, this has started introducing them to DeFi. So they'll see, oh, with time. So this money was crypto. Now I have converted it to my local currency. Ah, so we can slowly move down from the custodians of keys to actually having them be the holders of their own keys with time. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. The work Acre Africa by, is doing, by the way, is super fascinating, right? So they're essentially enable like just when I when I learned about your project, I was super blown away, right? The fact that you can essentially sort of execute these transactions utilizing USSD and integrate that with M-Pesa just speaks so much to the composability uh, of these different sort of building blocks and Legos. But I'd love to, and, and you mentioned as well, like mobile phones, right? We've seen an, an increase in, in traction with mobile phone use as well. And when it comes to crypto, we're still super far off. Um, you know, I tried editing an ENS record today on my cell phone, on my MetaMask. It was like su such a pain. Um, and, and so mobile phone sort of integration with wallets and generally just like crypto is still really far off. And I think that is a huge, huge unlock for, you know, there are more cell phones in Colombia than there are people. Right, so when you think about what that means for the development of a technology, that's really powerful. So the question is, you know, and, and maybe starting with you, Benson, what, are you, what do you feel are really the sort of at the use end user experience perspective, 
what are the big unlocks that are missing for DeFi here? You know, I'm sure we've got a room here full of people that are really keen to get building and are already exploring sort of problem spaces and solutions. So maybe we can touch a little bit on the current sort of end user challenges and what you believe are really the, the underlying underlocks and maybe we can work, work our way backwards here to get each of your, your thoughts on, on those aspects. Thank you, thank you, uh, Marcus. The, so the biggest two challenges that we see is capacity building. For them to understand that this is as good as M-Pesa, it's just uh, crypto. How do you make them understand that it's not uh, fraud? Uh, because then uh, that comes to my second point. We need to deal with the trust. Um, if we deal with them knowing how to work with it, then bringing tools, uh, introducing slowly, building on the blocks, uh, yeah, off-ramp solution, connect to M-Pesa. Then with time, you can go directly to the off-ramp, so uh, directly, they can now directly trade. They don't have to really withdraw because you'd ask a farmer, what's your incentive? You have been, re you re you've received a donation in USDC. Why are you withdrawing it to Mpesa? You can go to that merchant and whatever you wanted to buy, we still buy. And it will avoid the transactional fees that are in between here. So dealing with, uh, with trust, dealing with knowledge, and also, yeah, trying to reduce as much as possible the transaction fees. Transaction fees are a big issue. And uh, the interests that come in between these transactions, uh, we think those are the building blocks that can really bring a lot of adoption. Um, yeah, and also smartphone. Uh, the more smartphones people have, then more control of their own uh, DeFi gateways. Right, so smartphones, I think, are key. In, in Mexico, it's the same thing. Uh, people have phones, they access internet through their phones, but have no computers or anything, right? So we, we see that. Um, uh, I think one thing that I've come up with is that there are many people that with this uh, FOMO or with our situation, desperation, I don't know how to call it, um, they want to get rich right away, right? So uh, we see a lot of people that actually got scammed and getting one person that got scammed, like let's say the at the beginning in their journey, uh, it's super hard for them to get them back in again. So we see that happening. We see, them, we see there are people that have not good intentions and that are making it very, very hard for people like uh, all of these people here that are trying to make something good. So that's why you're, you're not mentioning crypto at all, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that's, that's, some, that's a real challenge. Uh, one person that got scammed once is going to convince 50 people, right. but one person that uses it, how many people you think is going to actually convert, let's say, so let's say in a word, two or three people? So that's a challenge. Uh, also, um, UX. Uh, fortunately, many tools have been translated to Spanish uh, and to different uh, languages around the world, but we still need that uh, community feeling because uh, in Latin America we are like very close. We like being in community, doing things in community. So uh, community, I think, is key. So we have a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, people building these communities. Uh, now we need to reach that next billion, right? So we need uh, to reach out, not just communities to keep to themselves, but how can we make that scalable? Let's say, not just convert once and then you get your crypto friends and then you have your 50 crypto friends and that's it. How can you get that sense of community uh, scalable in a trustworthy way? So I think that's an interesting question. And uh, UX, I think, is super important. Um, having applications, uh, we now see more and more crypto applications mobile first, which is great. Having just enough information in the screen that you need, I think that's super important to research and to actually uh, not just research with crypto people, research with the next billion, right? Because we're used to having your balance here, your wallet here, but uh, what do new users actually need, right? So that's a good question, I believe. Yeah. For us, it has been a very interesting case study. Um, what we did was we created a multilingual app 
it's available in english first hindi then and uh, then marathi which is another regional language in um so what happened was we we thought that okay we, multilingual app is going to be very good when we launched it we were uh, we we saw that okay the adoption is definitely not not that much so what happened was so what what basically happened we redesigned the entire system two years back again right after launching and we put all those same functionalities which is available to the farmer from their phone we put that on the the custodians end because they we have given we have given products to everyone to use uh, web based or mobile based so so that the farmer can just walk in which is the easiest thing to do and just request the the custodian that uh, please help me take a loan against it 6 months 8 months down the line or one year down the line gradually we were surprised again we saw that farmers have actually started liking the app i don't know we did not roll out any major upgrade we did not add any more languages it was there what was there but then i think somewhere the custodian started making the farmers believe that it is a very simple app to use just try it once let me guide you use the app and then see how it looks and then they found that yes it's a one click process one click loan application they are not accustomed to like like everyone else us they are not accustomed to getting uh, getting food delivered on phone getting insurance booked on the click of a button for them this was the first ever such application that they were seeing in their lives and now they have become very confident using it and as you said that you know one person how many people would they say would would they you know speak to uh, regarding the benefits that they've received in our case word of mouth have, has really worked because the farmers are very close right it's a very small community they have been there in that area since generations they know which warehouse is nearby which customer is nearby where they have to go they just with that word of mouth and they just started uh, telling everyone that hey do you know i mean i just got loan in 15 minutes i mean in my life my father has never seen it i have never seen it uh, and and whenever it happened it was like 13 to 15 days running post to pillar at banks and then then you know getting the loan and whenever you are running there you are not basically not farming and you are not earning so so this was very very revolutionary for them and now we can see that that adoption gap has really bridged because now they are they are comfortable as we move to other states so india has a lot of regional languages right Th hundreds or thousands i think so we would be just onboarding new languages which is not a difficult thing for our developers to do once we do that we have cracked that okay with the support of technology and with on ground support and which is already there from the government we don't have to deploy our boots on the ground so i think i think that is something that is is working really well for for farmers in india and i believe another thing that that comes to my mind is uh, in india again same thing as you said more more phones than people in colombia um india huge population 1.4 billion people but one thing is that with with a lot of changes in fintech uh, in in technology almost every other person is having a phone now not feature phone a smartphone right there are very cheap phones if i talk about indian rupees it's about what 6000 5000 indian rupees um maybe maybe uh, $70 $80 so people are buying people are buying these smartphones and now they are onboarded onto the technology every single uh, every single you know the cart roadside cart or vendor or uh, or or you know the auto wallas right the the uh, the local auto wallas everyone has a qr code you can just scan it and pay it it's not just us paying via qr code anymore it's almost everyone paying via qr has started paying via qr code that helps us that acts as a tailwind for us because they already have been using the phones we just say that okay let me let me open an app in your phone and that's it now start using this app for this uh, part of your life and and you it will all be solved and then they are very looking forward to that so that has helped us a lot in a country like india when we are going outside we'll see uh, you know what what other countries use so we'll have to adapt to that yeah maybe to contribute to the user interface yeah uh, to onboard more farmers so it's a combination of the user interface and user experience case in point in uh, one of the example in uh, selling insurance initially selling insurance uh, the agent would work with a, a, a folder with forms you would fill in the form would fill in fill in must sign etc so bring in a user interface that that is almost similar so we started with scratch cards so a scratch card that uh, they would scratch reveal a certain number and then now use the phone the ussd to send that number and automatically that's how they were onboarded into insurance we collect now information in that way technologically wise using triangulation with you leave them behind with a card and they will say oh this is my insurance the card but actually the insurance is something you cannot touch but if uh, such people now over time are able to dial the ussd code without having to 
scratch a card or remain with something since they've trusted the process. So that journey has to start somewhere, slowly bring them in and build that. So we see the, the need for you user experience that is well thought out. Yeah. Just to add to that, I mean, you're solving the insurance problem, honestly. Uh, so I have tried selling insurance before. So before uh, starting this organization, I was with, with a company called Policy Bazaar, which, so sells, which is an Indian unicorn sells insurance. Even selling insurance in an automated way to urban people, to educated people, is a difficult task. So with farmers, I'm pretty sure it's, it's a daunting task, but if it's getting solved, then I think the farmers are, are really getting a good service. I, I just, uh, one question to all of you. Like, you mentioned how much time do they actually, yeah. like, spend. spend to get a loan? Yeah. How much time is it? Earlier like, it was 13 to 15 days, now it's okay. uh, 10 to 15 minutes, which is like real time for Perfect. them. Perfect. So what about Guatemala? <laughs> yeah, so I was, uh, I mean, I, some, we, we held a side event the other day, and, and I mentioned this anecdote earlier, but I was sitting at the dinner table with my dad, and we were talking about, you know, I think he's yet to become a full-on sort of crypto convert. Um, we're working on it, but you, he was, we were sitting at the dinner table, and I was like, hey, let's both sit down on our phones and try and get a, let's try and get a loan. So he went on his, like, mobile banking app, had to fill out, like, a 20-minute survey, da 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 input all these different things. And he's like, oh, they'll, they'll get back to me in two weeks. Um, <laughs> I went on Ave, put up a, you know, over collateralized loan, done in five seconds, right? And I was like, check it out, here's my, here's my money. Um, and, and so I think, you know, literally in, in Guatemala it could take a number of weeks to get a loan, and that's the magic of this, right? And, and that's sort of a little bit of what the anecdote shows is, you know, a matter of seconds. Right, same in Mexico. I don't know. In, oh, in Kenya, because of the mobile money wallet, you can get a loan instantly. But now you pay heavily. Uh, by the time you calculate, it's over 120% interest. So, yeah. That's that's really common, by the way, for those of you that are surprised. In, yeah, in emerging economies... Really for us, it's a normal uh, interest rate. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can pay, like, you know it's bad when the interest rate is posted daily, and it's like 2% daily. Wow. Um, so yeah, this this is the reality of, of the countries that you know we're in, and this is what DeFi is here to disrupt and promise, right? When you think about the fact that you can take out a loan on DeFi for you know three five percent, obviously there's a lot of questions here around the collateral, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and but the reality is, it's you know there's there's a lot to be said for how can we bring down you know interest rates that are hundreds of percentage points, thousands at times, um, down to you know single single uh, single percentage points. So. Just, we will do just like one last question, um, and this will be just a bit of a go around, and then we'd love to open it up to the audience for, for a bit of Q&A in the last 10 minutes. Um, so, the, we've got a room here, obviously, of people that are all largely, probably very familiar with the space and the ecosystem, and, and the question would be, and we, we spoke previously about what are the challenges on the other side, right? So what are the challenges for the end users in Africa and Asia and in, and in Latin America as well? Uh, but I, I guess I'd like to flip the question on the other side of that is like, what's coming back to, you, to the Ethereum ecosystem by deploying these solutions, right? We're, we're no longer becoming a self-referential system. We're actually able to draw in a lot of feedback and a lot of input around user experience, around mobile phone adoption, you know, all these other things. So if, if maybe we can just spend like a few minutes on on that, and then we'll turn it over to the audience for, for a quick Q and A. Um, so yeah, just feel free to take it away on what can you know what can the Ethereum community learn from deploying last mile DeFi solutions. Let me maybe let me start with what the the community has done when uh, it realizes you're doing something. So for us, when we said okay, we need to solve this problem, we immediately got support from the community. The Ethereum community is. Passionate. The, 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 the people who are here, I believe most of the people who are here are passionate. So the first help we got was from Etherisk. Is a, uh, they were they had built a generic insurance framework, and they, they said, okay, uh, you can build your application on top. We'll give you technical support, and we'll give you time, and we'll always spend ensure that you're able to run it. We received support from the foundation, Ethereum Foundation. They helped in the networking. And we also chain link hard about it because we are using weather data to determine whether to pay a claim or not. So they say, how can we help to ensure that your source of truth is actually a source of truth? And not only that, moreover, financially, they got a lot of financial support, got a lot of human uh, people spending time with you, people experts who are very busy spending time with you uh, to help you. And uh, also now with that, 
I think we can say the, the community um, and what people should do, if you hear of a good project, I think uh, we couldn't have been here if we, people didn't just come and jump in and helped in the, in, the, in the journey. So we could say, let's be lights on the paths of starting projects and uh, you will see great, great impact because of that. So I could say that uh, uh, on uh, the support, the community uh, has helped. And now, now what, what are we seeing the community learning? You see, like lessons learned for us, the community is able to understand you can't just directly bring in uh, crypto and you expect the farmer to use. So these research lessons, uh, other people now are able to apply on their different projects if they need to reach the last mile customers. Thank you. Well, first, um, I would like to say that, well, if we are onboarding people from our countries that, let's say, as I said, live day by day, we're bringing in people that can use this to benefit in their real life, and we can bring actually uh, these examples and get the community and in, in, in give it, let's say, more empathy, right? Because sometimes we are, yeah, I mean, we're here, we have a roof, we have uh, air conditioning and we're not get, if it rains, there's no problem. We can go out and get uh, water and drinks and go to a bathroom and we have everything, right? So uh, getting these people into the, the space could be very interesting because that way we could maybe uh, be sensible to the realities of others and how can they benefit. So I think empathy is an interesting part and also we're bringing in people that actually need financing, need things. So we can actually also balance the offer and demand. So that could also be interesting for community. Yeah. So uh, talking about giving back to the Ethereum community, right, or, or bringing the Ethereum community on board, um, Ethereum has reached millions, right? And that's what the purpose of the next objective is, to reach the next billion. Um, with, with all these projects, so these are a these are few handful of the projects in Kenya, India, Latin America. There are so many more projects that are already on Ethereum or on one of the L2s and trying to, trying to get a larger share of the ecosystem. So I believe that, uh, that by, by bringing, by the support, first of all, with the foundation, with the community, it's a huge community, right? Uh, the largest of, of all the chains that we know. Altogether, I think, I think we are at such a right spot to, to like be in a very synergistic relationship where, where the projects need communities. No project works without community, you name any, right? And, and then once that is done, more and more projects can come on the chain, come into the ecosystem, help each other reach more masses. If we are reaching maybe uh, smallholder marginal farmers in India, uh, someone else could be reaching blue collar workers in, in, in uh, uh, Australia or anywhere else, right? There are still so many projects and things that can, that can still come on the, on the chain. And, and I think now is the right, sp right spot, right time to do that. So that's what we are looking for to it. Incredible, thank you. I'm uh, yeah, just incredibly honored to be sharing the stage here with you all. And we've got a, a few minutes left here. So um, maybe we'll just take a few questions uh, and then we'll, we'll call it a day. So gentleman with the blue shirt, uh, you put your hand up first. Yeah, and sorry, if you could, maybe we'll, we'll just pass the mic over to you. Hello, um, fellow Latin American here. It's good to hear that, it's, that this, is doing a, this, is, this is doing some good. Um, I want to know if, uh, well, as I understand, you are all using uh, the blockchain more to register people uh, or, their, or the hashes of their information. So are you planning to use, uh, to use that information and that identity, you being a verifier so that, for example, we c they can use a protocol similar to the proof of humanity that was here around uh, an hour ago. So that, for example, you can prove that that person exists uh, more than just that person uh, being able to receive a loan. Yeah, I definitely see us contributing to proof of humanity. For example, what represents a person for us is a transaction which is hashed. So the, if the details of the person, as the same way we do the passwords, can't be hashed because we don't do that, we just, just do the entire thing, then we can contribute in some way because that hash is a combination of the location 
of their names, their phone number registered in government, and many other details. So we feel uh, looking at how, uh, uh, what we using, how can we use this hash to prove it's the truth? Yeah, the ZK roll-up ATC, I think it's uh, part of uh, the thing that can work. So yeah, just want to add to that. Likewise, we also do not put the direct details. It's it's not right, you know, because you have a right to, for you need to give a right to forget, right? Um, and uh, once you put all your, all their PIIs onto the blockchain, you cannot forget them. So uh, but there are, these are the challenges, but yeah, somewhere if we can, you know, uh, you know, taking more solutions and bringing some sort of identity on blockchain, like from the foundation, I was having a very good discussion regarding, so in India, we have Aadhaar, which is like with 1.4 billion people. If we onboard that onto the blockchain, just imagine what kind of identification can that be, right? And then you can subsequently use it possibly across other chains, you know, cross chain uh, as well. But yeah, it will always have some challenges. It will have, you know, uh, uh, barriers to entry as well. Uh, but at this moment, I don't think that uh, a lot of people are putting identity directly on blockchain or maybe col combining it with some sort of DID, decentralized identity, and making it work, but not, not in 100% of it. Yeah, in, in my opinion, I think it could be interesting combining reputation with proof of humanity because that makes, uh, if someone, uh, for example, didn't pay a saving circle, they get a bad reputation in their wallet and it's permanent, right? Um, then they can just change wallets, right? But linking that to uh, proof of humanity, I think that's interesting. Uh, for the moment, we're not putting uh, any personal information on chain. It's your wallet. If you paid or you didn't pay, it's stored with the event of the smart contract and that's how it's tracked. Thank uh, you. Um, yeah, sure, right, right there. Second row. Thank you. Hi, Sion. Uh, the principal, the capital, comes from DeFi or CeFi? And inter the interest rate, the initial, what is approximately uh, how much sure. pay of interest the, the taker? Sure. Thank you. I think that the question is to me anyway. So, um, so uh, yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's the beautiful part of the entire platform. Since two and a half years, banks have already been giving loans on the platform, seven million till now. That's completely centralized finance loan, as you can see. Now, once we go live on the mainnet, it would be uh, DeFi loans as well. They would be disjointed in, amongst themselves, right? The CeFi and DeFi part, but the farmer would have access to both from the click of a button. So you see, it's a bridge. It's not we are stopping one and starting another. It's just that we are bridging. In fact, yeah, so, so that's, that's what it's the need of the hour at this moment. And whenever the farmer would see that, okay, one, CFI has a lower interest rate or DeFi has a lower interest rate, they can just go ahead and, and choose that option. Farmer has nothing to do with which I'm specifically choosing, right? One point here is that for the DeFi solution, we would also need an off-ramp solution because you can imagine, I, I can't just go ahead and give USDC to a farmer and say that, okay, yeah, you know, buy your next crops, uh, you know, next season cycle for the, with that USDC. So that is a challenge. You asked about interest rate. It is uh, currently 9% per annum. So it's very low. It's one of the lowest in India. And we have uh, seen across other countries as well that this interest rate is very, very low uh, in the market. And once we go on DeFi, we're expecting somewhere around 7 to 11% again which is a very stable interest rate in, in terms of DeFi. I'm personally really excited for when a farmer in India can buy their crops with crypto. That's, uh, that's right, yeah. something to be excited about. Yeah. So um, yeah, Deepa there, and this will be the, the last uh, question, and then um, we'll just yeah, close Yeah, I off. just wanted to say that Ethereum Foundation has done a great job by uniting a four, I don't know how many fellows are there in, all together. There's seven. Seven, seven in the second fellows. cohort. And now yeah. you all are talking to each other and uh, you all are collaborating and learning from each other. But there are many other projects in the Ethereum ecosystem and that are doing, reaching to the next billion people. Like there's Good Dollar, there's Proof of Humanity, there is uh, Human Dao. Human Dao is actually bringing work to people, providing economic opportunities. So I think it's very important that maybe we need to form like a next billion Dao or something where everybody can be in one group and then on top of your like your services you can provide their services and stuff like that and learn from each other because uh, for instance good dollars in over 200 countries and as part of my study because i'm writing a book on impact house uh human Dao and good dollar were part of my studies and they got to learn about each other and now they're working together you know in in a lot of countries that they're going to so i think it's very important that we start like a next billion Dao or something like that 
I, I think that's like a, a really, really fascinating idea. And I mean, I think that's a lot of the, the work that I'm doing is, is basically ecosystem research. Um, and what will come out of that is basically a whole ecosystem map of different folks working on these specific solutions, sort of focusing on DeFi. Um, so I, I think that's a, a great proposition. I don't know if there's anything else you guys, yeah. No, it's just similar to where we were talking about yesterday, like how to gather these projects in an organized, trustworthy way. So yeah. interesting question. Yeah, I think DAOs are pretty early still because you know so many more use cases are coming on DAO. But I think that's a good idea. Next, you know, DAO for the next billion is is going to be a good. Yeah. 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 So Definitely. I think that's a good thing to explore. And congratulations on your book. Yeah. Awesome. So just last minute, maybe just a quick go around. Um, where can people find your work? Where can they find you? And uh, yeah, we'll wrap it up. Yeah, you can find us at B Bloinks, B L O, like a uh, block with uh, the sound of a pig, <laughs> where you put your piggyback savings. Nice. That's it. <laughs> you can find me on Twitter at Ben Juguna, on in, uh, uh, Instagram. No, no. Twitter is uh, Benson <laughs> underscore Juguna <laughs> on uh, Telegram. It's at Ben Juguna. And email uh, ben Ju B in Juguna at Eka Africa and website ekafrica.com. Uh, yeah. yeah, so for me, it's, uh, it's the, the product name is Whirl. W H R R L comes from warehouse receipt lending with an extra R in between. Uh, or just search for Abhishek Bhattacharya. Twitter is that Abhishek Bhattacharya at the rate. Yeah, that's all. So I think you should be able to find us online from the agenda anyway. It's there. Incredible, thank you. Yeah. How about you, Marcus? Uh, find you? Marcus.am is my website and my Twitter as well. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Big round of applause for these incredible panelists.